Dragonlance was easily one of the most popular D&D modules ever and spawned a massive shared universe with over 190 books. But unlike fantasy giants like Earthsea Cycle and Game of Thrones, Dragonlance, to me at least, always felt like a bit of a cult classic, despite probably being hugely influential to fantasy as a whole. I mean, what's not to love? You have it all here. Massive armies of good and evil dragons smashing together with the fate of the world in the balance, love triangles, and even an empire of minotaurs. But here's the thing. This series has had a crazy history full of ups and downs that have continued up to the modern day, and I'm talking as recently as like last week. So, Let's get into whatever happens to Dragonlance. Hi everyone, my name is Otto and welcome to Exits Examines. We will be exploring the lives of people, companies, and more after their prime time has seemingly come to an end. If that sounds good to you, there's a like and subscribe button below. To someone stepping into the world of Dragonlance, I have to admit it can be super intimidating with all the additions, books, and history. Well, a good place to start is a car ride with married couple Laura and Tracy Hickman. The Hickmans thought up Dragonlance as a way to bring the dragons back to Dungeons & Dragons on a way to an interview at TSR, the company behind D&D. Back then, TSR was facing some pretty significant financial issues. Their core games needed a refresh, and a 1983 marketing survey revealed that while there were a ton of dungeons in D&D, it was surprisingly lacking in dragons. TSR, realizing that they needed a new direction, tasked Hickman and other creators to create an epic dragon-themed product line. This would be a grand story-driven multimedia project encompassing miniatures, novels, I mean, even calendars with jaw-dropping artwork, the whole nine yards. Now, this new multimedia direction brings us nicely to Margaret Weiss, who joined TSR in 1983 and would become a key player in this initiative, which would be called Project Overlord. At first, she was tasked with finding a writer for the new novels, but this turned out to be quite the challenge, because finding an author on a budget and also willing to work within the constraints of a D&D universe was difficult to say the least. After getting an initial draft, Weiss and Hickman seem to look at each other and say, you know, hey, we could do better ourselves. So that's exactly what they did. Now, this was a match made in heaven, and they masterfully translated D&D's rules into a captivating novel, which would lay the foundation for the rich campaign setting. And you can easily see how all the main characters pretty much embody their classic D&D classes. So Dragons of Autumn Twilight was completed by the end of 1984, and TSR initially doubted the book's potential, so they only ordered a minimum print run of just 50,000 copies. However, to probably everyone's surprise, it became nothing less than a bestseller and rocketed the series into the limelight. The Dragonlance modules themselves offered a complete campaign arc with pre-written characters creating a more cinematic experience compared to traditional campaigns, even though it might have come at the cost of player agency. Classic fantasy tropes like thrilling quests, epic battles, and the search for ancient artifacts are woven together with iconic characters like Sturm, Fizban, and of course, Tass. So what's it all about? Well, the core of this story is the incredible, unique, and sprawling world of Kryn. Dragonlance is not afraid to wear its influences on its sleeve, and you can absolutely see the influence of The Lord of the Rings and Star Wars thrown in here, and the scope is just fantastic. Good and evil gods vie for dominance, a fascinating alignment-based magic system, and this just incredible 
incredible artwork brought this entire world to life. Even though the story might seem, well, a bit familiar with a group of adventurers reuniting in a world threatened by evil powers, its simplicity was a strength. D&D finally had its own epic fantasy saga. Massive battles between good and evil, all set against a backdrop of this incredible world building. It was just irresistible to people at the time, and this was just the start. Now, a huge part of this world is the books, which took on a life of their own, and this is personally where I got into the series, although I'm embarrassed to say at the time I didn't even realize it was a part of D&D. The first book has gotten some criticism for its writing quality, but Hickman and Weiss were able to find their footing and the books really took on a life of their own over time. Some of these absolutely hooked me as a kid and a huge shout out to Soul Forge and Test of Twins, although I'm probably giving away who my favorite character is. But with over 190 books, I mean, where do you even start? Well, there's no right or wrong answer, but I mean, there kind of is a right answer. You have to start with the first trilogy, the Dragonlance Chronicles. After that, you'll usually see people recommend the Legends trilogy about the twins Raceland and Karaman, which arguably is the pinnacle of the series writing. These six books are pretty much the Dragonlance Bible and mandatory reading, as they give you the foundation for the major gods, factions, and themes that tie the series together. Where you go from there is kind of up to you, but the Lost Chronicles are a great addition to the original trilogy. The Second Generation and Dragons of Summer Flame are always great, even though parts of them can be absolutely heartbreaking. The War of Souls trilogy and Dark Disciple are also worthy reads, but you know, only following the core series would be a massive disservice because there are literally over a hundred novels, each offering unique perspectives and adventures within the universe, even if they are of varying quality. But you know, there's something out there for everyone with great works from authors like Richard Knack and Douglas Niles. And this shared universe is, in my opinion, one of the most interesting parts about Dragonlance. And in interviews, Margaret Weiss has had similar sentiments, and she's gone on to say that Dragonlance became not just her world, but everyone's world. And it's a great concept, even if it's not purely artistic. TSR seemed to want to seize on Dragonlance's popularity, but the thing about authors is that they can only write so much. So the solution is simple. More authors equals more books equals more money. Fans might have criticized some of these books for any number of reasons, recycled tropes, formulaic quests, and a perceived drop in quality, but despite all of this, the series remained undeniably popular. And it wasn't just books though, oh no. There was also a Dragonlance movie in 2008 based on Dragons of Autumn Twilight. It was a direct adaptation from the book, but this actually proved to be more of a hindrance than anything because entire arcs and sections had to be cut due to time constraints. Originally, it was planned to be a live action movie, but the budget just wasn't there for it, and the team landed on this kind of bizarre mix of animation and CGI, which is honestly a bit jarring. This all led to pretty poor reviews, and sadly, no additional films have ever been greenlit since. While the movie was not so successful, I was shocked to find out that Dragonlance did pretty well on the game front. Even more so, I got a bit sad doing this research because some of these games I would have eaten up as a kid. Released in 1988 and 1989, Heroes of the Lance and its sequels Dragons of Flame were based on the original books and were side-scrolling action games. You had access to the original party including Tass, Flint, Sturm, etc., but only one could appear on screen at one time and all had different stats. Although considered a decent side-scroller for its time, this was apparently pretty notorious for its punishing difficulty. 
in a completely different direction and also released in 1989 was Dragon Strike. And it's essentially a flight sim where you dive bomb the poor minions of darkness while riding a dragon. Incredibly enough, it was developed by Westwood, you know, the same people who made Command and Conquer. It's actually really fun and fascinating because I can't think of too many other flight sim games based in fantasy. If you can believe it, yet another game was released in 1989 and had a whole other take on the series. The War of the Lance is a turn-based strategy game, and if you squint your eyes, it's kind of like an extremely primitive and early version of Total War during the war in the first books. It's kind of amazing that this game exists as most D&D games to my knowledge are more role playing and to have this grand strategy game complete with diplomacy is just fascinating to see. Shadow Sorcerer in 1991 put more emphasis on real time combat and strategy using two modes of gameplay. One as kind of a world map and the second being a tactical mode in an isometric view. It's a fascinating insight into the development of strategy games at the time, although it was criticized for poor AI and progression, but you can really see the bones here of what would become the CRPG genre, which is really cool. The Kryn series, including Champions of Kryn, Death Knights of Kryn, and the Dark Queen of Kryn, take place after the Dragonlance War and offers a pure, unadulterated D&D experience. Released in 1990, these games allowed you to create a party, dungeon crawl, and even transfer your party throughout the games. This was part of the legendary gold box series of games using the D&D rule sets, and although it can be a bit clunky to pick up for new gamers, it's great to see where it all started from. Although it's heartbreaking in a way because in the early 90s, there was this explosion of Dragonlance games, and then it just stopped. It's a real shame that there haven't been any modern Dragonlance video games because I'm convinced an open world game where you fly around Kryn on the back of a dragon would be incredible. Now, it's impossible to talk about Dragonlance without talking about its rocky history, so let's get into it. After the explosive and honestly probably surprising success of Dragonlance, a rift quickly formed between creators Weiss and Hickman and TSR. Feeling undervalued, they left TSR to pursue other works and eventually returned to write what they thought would be the final Dragonlance novel, Dragons of Summer Flame in 1995 to coincide with Dragonlance Fifth Age, which would work under a new diceless system. The new module was met with mixed reception and would only worsen TSR's general financial issues, which would culminate when Wizards of the Coast acquired them in 1997. Weiss and Hickman would return to write the War of Souls trilogy and Lost Chronicles in the 2000s, but at this point, Dragonlance and D&D as a whole was in a bit of a slump. But as we know today, this would not be the end. Over the years, due to a few factors, D&D would become arguably its most popular ever. And just like that, Wizards started looking through some of their old brands and Dragonlance was back on. And oh boy, did this not go smoothly. Apparently, Weiss and Hickman learned that Wizards wanted to bring back Dragonlance and the two parties struck a deal. Things allegedly got messy in the editing phase where apparently issues were brought up around sexism and race. As things broke down, Wizards wanted to drop the project entirely and Weiss and Hickman were having none of it and filed a lawsuit because all of their work had essentially gone up in smoke. Now, it's hard to know the reality here without seeing the original agreement, but in yet another twist in 2021, Weiss and Hickman voluntarily dismissed their lawsuit, and the start of the new trilogy, Dragons of Deceit, would eventually release in 2022. But are you ready for this? Because things took yet another turn after Weiss and Hickman stated that they were not consulted in the making of Wizards' new Dragonlance reboot, Shadow of the Dragon Queen, or its companion, 
board game. Weiss would go on to very publicly and very recently throw shade on Twitter, and Hickman would elaborate to say, quote, they didn't ask for any consultation. They didn't even tell us that they were going to be doing it. It is a vision of Dragonlance that has no connection to ours. This backlash happened during rumors of a live-action Dragonlance adaptation where actor Joe Manganiello, a huge fan, confirmed he was developing a TV series, but that it wasn't moving forward following the sale by Hasbro, the owner of Wizards. Manganiello seemed super passionate about the project and apparently worked closely with Weiss and Hickman, and I gotta say it's too bad that the show never materialized because the man seems all about it and claims to have written over a thousand page lookbook featuring concepts for arms, armor, and even the dragons. Manganiello theorized that Dragonlance was shot down by what he calls in his own words a failed board game reboot. So where does that leave us in 2024? Between the sinking of the show, Weiss and Hickman's criticisms, and an underperforming Shadow of the Dragon Queen, the future of the series is pretty uncertain, although there will at least be one more Dragonlance novel coming out soon. Although with the overwhelming resurgence of interest in D&D with Baldur's Gate 3 and Manganiello's huge passion for pushing the TV show, you never know what might happen. Regardless of the future of the series, the entire situation feels like an unfortunate state of affairs for this incredible body of work, so we can just hope that it doesn't end here. But even if it did, it left behind a pretty incredible legacy, bringing in a new style of storytelling and acting as a turning point where D&D became so much more than just a game. It does have to be said though that some people do mark Dragonlance as a turning point where profits from tie-ins became the priority, but on the other hand, all these tie-ins brought in a huge number of fans to D&D and fantasy as a whole, myself included, so I can't personally give this too much flack. If nothing else, we can thank the series for revitalizing the fantasy genre, a cast of incredible characters, and of course the concept of pirate minotaurs. But what do you think? What was your introduction to Dragonlance, and where do you think the future of the series will be? As always, thank you so much to my Patreons who keep this channel alive, and let me know if any of you have ideas for what you want me to cover next in the comments below. It's always really interesting to hear what you have to say. Thanks a lot, and I'll see you next time. Bye!